OK, so um, welcome, everybody. Uh, thank you so much for um, attending this information session this afternoon. Um, I really appreciate how busy everybody is, particularly um, as we're not far off the um, the beginning of term. Um, and I know some of you won't have had a break over the summer as well, but um, I really do appreciate uh, you joining us as we do a bit of reflecting on some of the new ways of working that the Area Senko team are proposing for the future. And we just wanted to give you all an opportunity to um, um, share the thinking behind some of the proposals that we're making and obviously to comment and ask um, any questions. So uh, on a really practical note, as um, I've got a few slides to go through, um, if you've got something that you'd like to, um, to raise or to ask, um, then please do um, pop a question into the chat. I've got colleagues from the team uh, who, are, who are with me are going to try and remind me to pick up on questions, but we will um, definitely, I'm well, fairly confident that we won't use the, the full hour uh, that we've kind of set aside for this meeting. To, to make the presentation um, deliberately so that we've got a little bit of time at the end if people would like to um, you know make comments um, ask questions etc so don't feel if, um, if if you don't want to interrupt the session so to speak although I'm very happy for people to do that um, then by all means there will be um, a time at the end you could wait till then uh, to do that okay so we wanted to share with you um, our thinking, as I say, behind why we've had a little bit of a, of a rethink, if you like, um, around the way that we're um, delivering our area Senko support for settings. Um, and there's a, a various reasons for this, um, a couple of them captured on the slide there. Um, you're probably well aware, um, knowing the children you have within your setting, um, that there's definitely an increase in numbers of children with um, special educational needs. Um, and we are definitely experiencing um, an increase in referrals to our service. Um, the difficulty with that is that there are the same number of us and we're very, very keen to give you as much support as we possibly can. So we've constantly got to reflect on what the most effective way uh, to do this is. Um, the other thing that I'm sure you will be um, really aware of as well is um, the complexity of, of children's needs um, definitely do seem to be increasing year on year, um, whereas you might have uh, come across, you know, very few children that have that kind of multi-agency support in the past. Uh, increasingly, we're working with settings with high numbers of children uh, with quite complex needs and support across several different services. Um, so therefore, you know, that, that's an added kind of pressure, if you want to say, onto the service um, and obviously onto yourselves in just getting it right and making sure that we're, we're doing our best together to meet those children's needs. Um, the, the other um, uh, sort of reason, if you like, behind us having this uh, reflection um, is all the learning that we've all done um, in new ways of working during the pandemic. Um, nobody's suggesting that this pandemic is going away in a, in, in, in a hurry, um, but even you know when hopefully it does, we still feel there's things we'd like to carry forward into our sort of normal working practice, if you like, because we feel that we've learned some real lessons from uh, implementing different ways of working during this period um, and listening to feedback. We've been listening to um, verbal feedback from yourselves, from parents, um, and we've also um, taken a little bit of a survey and I'll, I'll share some of the, the findings from that later, um, just trying to get a flavour uh, of, of what people are feeling about some of the new ways that we've introduced of working. I think, um, you know, when, when I look back personally, um, you know, sort of 18 months ago, um, you know, if you'd been, if you'd said to me that I'd be addressing, um, you know, a, a large group of people on something called Teams and we'd be recording it and uploading it to YouTube, I would have just thought you were talking about something that sounded quite science fiction, if I'm honest. Um, I'm not particularly tech savvy person, um, not very confident in that area, but I think all of us um, have been on, you know, the cliche, um, that steep learning curve that everybody mentions, but I think we've all had to assimilate huge amount of learning really quickly. And then it's, I guess, how to capitalise that on how to keep the good bits, if you like, and, um, and keep that sort of effective approach that we've developed in so many areas. So what do we think are the reasons behind uh, those increased referrals and we've done some thinking within our service and we've done a little bit of analysis of that um, as to as to why um, over on the 
the left of the slide there, um, you know, we we acknowledge how good early year settings are now at recognising children's needs earlier. We think people are um, very quick uh, to notice and to start monitoring and observing. You often have children in your settings from a younger age, uh, when all the two-year-old funding started back in the day. Um, there are um, a lot more children accessing that um, provision earlier and therefore you're picking up um, their needs but what that means is that um, our caseloads uh, are, are increasing as we have children with us for longer if they uh, come onto our caseload at two then they're kind of with us through into the reception year which is as it should be uh, but we have to look at how to to manage that and to give the most effective support in the most effective um, timely way. Um, other thing that you'll be really aware of is that two year check by health visitors and obviously your own um, two year check that you do, which is really ensuring that we're highlighting children's needs earlier. Um, and as I said with the first point, um, that's great news. You know, that's exactly what we want to achieve. Um, but it does need managing in terms of making sure that we're supporting in a meaningful way. Um, and the, the other sort of national fact, if you like, that does have um, some impact on uh, this conversation is around those survival rates for extremely premature babies, um, you know, in, in, um, in a very good way, you know, that is increasing um, and it, not in every case does it um, equate to children having additional needs. But I think, um, you know, we do need to recognise that sometimes those are uh, children who do have, um, even if they're transitory needs, they do have those needs that might require require uh, that multi-agency response. So what have we done about this? Because there have been the same number of us in the in the service. Those of you who've been a, around for a few years will 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 know that um, uh, there's been the same number of us, um, you know, for the last sort of eight or nine years uh, that the service has existed as it is. Um, and so what what we've done really to try and and, and manage this ever increasing um, demand, if you if you like, um, is is just being really clear uh, with you about that graduated response. Um, you're all really familiar through your Senko training, et cetera, around the expectations through the core standards as well um, of how we will make those different levels of response to children's needs, that universal, uh, that SEND support, and then those very, very few children with high needs. Um, and so we know that you're able to make really good provision in your settings for children at that universal level and at that SEND support level. Um, and therefore, we expect to be sort of called in for support, if you like, uh, when children are moving from perhaps that SEND support into sort of what we would consider to have high needs. Um, and so we've been very clear through the um, core standards and through the workshops and the training and things that we've offered, uh, what the expectations are. And, and what's brilliant is, you know, everybody stepped up to the plate and um, that really good provision is being put in place um, in the first instance. Capacity building for the sector, that's come through um, training. You'll all be aware of the initial SENCO training that we offer. And now hopefully you're aware that we have the option for the level three training um, so that you can get that national early year SENCO award. Um, we've got our ongoing inclusive communi communication training and the AET, um, the Autism Education Trust, some of which um, you may well have accessed through the earliest communities. Um, we obviously have our workshop packages, which have been around for a few years now, offering that ongoing um, professional development for um, early years SENCOs. And so through all of that, um, uh, all of that training, we're aware that settings are generally feeling more confident and more able to kind of um, work at meeting children's needs before they necessarily have to make a referral through to to our service and that's all helped to manage uh, that the, the increase in referrals um, you'll be aware that we have um, already even before the pandemic time started to introduce what we're sort of calling a more light touch approach to some of our review visits and that might entail a phone call to the setting and obviously more recently could be a teams meeting uh, where we're just checking in with you we know that you've had advice you probably have information and care plans from other services and therefore um, our involvement um, as we say might be a more light touch um, approach 
And also um, we've put in place um, a setting to school uh, model for transition meetings for those children who would really benefit from some transition planning, but are not necessarily those children we would regard as needing um, a sort of full school entry plan meeting where our service would be involved. Um, and so I know a lot of you will have been involved with kind of running your own transition meetings from your setting to the school. Um, and that's a really effective way where once again, um, your um, um, as I say, stepping up to the plate and really taking that responsibility and supporting and working in partnership with us so that we can focus our time in um, where it's it's most essentially needed. One um, document which I'm not expecting you to be able to read, so please don't worry, there's a lot of information on there. It was just something that when we were talking within our service, we wanted to just flag up again. It's quite an old document um, and it is called Questions for Early Years Senkos to Consider. Um, it's around the... Um, graduated response as outlined in the SEND Code of Practice, um, and it's available on our um, Area Senko webpage on the SSE website. Um, and we put it together a few years ago, and I know we promoted it through workshops and things, but it's just a revisit, if you like, uh, because what it's giving you are those kind of prompting questions that you can talk to each other about within the setting. Might be the Senko talking to the key worker, or could be talking amongst yourselves at a staff meeting, just asking those pertinent questions about have we already tried an ECAT uh, with this child with communication needs? Um, have we um, worked? with parents on strategies that are really successful at home. They're all things that we are really aware of and know, but we pulled them into one document because it was a nice prompt sheet we felt. And particularly if you've got newer members of your team, um, it's quite a good way of really supporting them with that graduated response. So we just wanted to kind of flag that up there so that you were um, aware of it. Um, as mentioned on the previous slide, there's been a lot of learning for all of us um, from the pandemic period and in particular um, around virtual working. Um, and I think what we wanted to highlight here is some of the um, uh, pros and cons, if you like, um, uh, as we've uh, reflected on it as a service and also as we've spoken to practitioners and as we've um, spoken to parents. I mean, one really obvious one is around um, a reduction in travel for our service simply equates to more time for us to support more children. I mean, it's a very, it's very simple maths. And so um, we're absolutely, as you will gather in the in the next few slides, we're absolutely not saying that we're not going to be traveling out to see people in settings. But what we are saying is we're really thinking carefully about how best to use that time and when it's really important and crucial to um, go out and make that visit and when it's more efficient and effective um, to use the format that we're all using here this afternoon um, thereby reducing that travel time not just for us by the way but you know obviously for you coming out to training and things like that um, the other thing um, that will obviously be the knock on there is that we hope that we can really manage any waiting times that people have had to access support from the service. I mean, clearly, um, we won't see dramatic reductions because of the um, increase in referrals and complexity of children's needs mentioned in the, in the earlier slides, but it will help to really manage um, that um, waiting time uh, if we are not traveling quite as much. Uh, parents, we've noticed, can access meetings either from workplace um, or from the home if they've got uh, care commitments at home. And we have found that parents have given really positive feedback of being able to do that um, because previously sometimes they've not been able to join us because they've um, obviously had those uh, um, uh, commitments, if you like. So uh, that's that's been uh, been a plus. Um, and we one um, thing that we really did talk about quite a lot in our team is how we've noticed that virtual discussions with yourselves, practitioners, and senkos um, are often very much more focused and effective um, when we have perhaps a shorter Teams or phone discussion um, than when we are. A trying to kind of find a way of having that conversation with you within the setting because as you very very well know there are so many pulls on your time um, so many things that um, crop up when you're sort of on the floor and we've all um, 
reminisced on situations where we've been following a practitioner around as they've been pulled off to change a nappy or to um, pick somebody up who's fallen over and all the things that happen in that everyday working life. Um, whereas if we've had a, perhaps a shorter, very focused time where someone's been able to come briefly off the floor and have a really focused conversation with us around a particular child's needs and brought with them the paperwork that they're currently using, etc. We found that the quality of the conversation and the way that um, we've been able to um, analyse things together um, has been has been much um, higher. So that was just um, a, a bit of feedback that we hadn't really kind of um, considered until we were all kind of reflecting on it. Um, one of the um, one of the little images I wanted to share with you there um, was uh, that's something that we've all learned during the, the pandemic. You may not be able to um, read to read the text, but it says at the top, here's what you see. Um, and then here's what you don't see. So you're going to um, and we also learned uh, we've also learned how to blur our backgrounds out, as you can tell this afternoon. So um, I think uh, in, in all serious, I think what what we've all learned, though, is how to effectively use tools like Teams um, for such as delivering training. Um, I mean, our service didn't know initially how to create little breakout rooms for discussions, um, how to share screens, which is still a bit of a mystery to me some days, um, and, and many other things that we now just do on a day to day basis. And so I think the the quality of what we're able to offer now um, through um, this kind of virtual platform has has really increased, uh, which is why, you know, we're wanting to keep some elements of it um, in, in uh, what we're delivering. Um, we have also, as mentioned, been really listening to feedback from practitioners um, and from parents. And there are some very, very strong views and clear reasons why, um, you know, we would want to keep face to face working um, in certain situations. Um, we've collated sort of anecdotal feedback from parents and settings. And also, as I mentioned earlier, done a, um, a survey um, out um, to uh, people during the end of the summer term when we had meetings with them. Um, we would then pop them a little Microsoft Forms uh, survey afterwards, and we've collated some information from there. And so, um, you know, where we uh, feel that face to face working has uh, a really strong place is around building relationships um, between parents, between professionals. And so I think that points at those initial contacts that we have um, being a really crucial point to prioritise for face to face. Um, it's no doubt that some parents and some practitioners just feel more relaxed and confident meeting in person. Um, Conversely, some feel the opposite, particularly parents. Um, I've definitely had parents saying that they felt much happier joining a meeting, um, you know, sitting in the comfort of their home than they did coming into perhaps a setting or um, another meeting venue. So uh, either can be true, but for some uh, people in some situations, it can be definitely the case that face to face works better. And obviously, if there's sensitive things to discuss, then, um, you know, we need to be really aware that that would be a priority um, for a face to face meeting. Um, we can also um, make those observations of children, as you know, in their typical play situations in a setting. And that's um, a really uh, critical part of those um, initial contacts that we have. And so all of these are things that we would want to uh, very much um, preserve, if you like, and, and take forward in our in our new approach to working. Um, and as you all know, there can be technical issues using virtual formats. So, you know, that's something that, although I think we're getting much better at resolving them, hasn't completely gone away. Um, although I have to say, once again, uh, as we were talking at a team meeting, we were all fondly remembering face-to-face -face training where we'd grappled with overhead projectors and lights that didn't work and um, other kind of technical hitches that we had in the room, even when we were with everybody all together. So um, it's very possible to have a technical hitch um, either on Teams or in the real world. Um, so it, it can happen in, in either case. So let's move on to um, a bit more of the nitty gritty then about the um, the proposals that we're, we're making around um, new ways of, of working. Um, and very clearly, as we've just um, alluded to, you know, we we definitely will be continuing with face to face working um, for key uh, elements of our service delivery. Um, it's something that we really enjoy doing. I wouldn't want anybody to feel that um, any move towards virtual working um, is is in any way because um, we um, are not 
you know, really enjoying visiting settings and we always feel welcome, um, but we just also need to look at the most effective use of our time. Um, so observations um, as part of preschool entry planning support uh, are one of the um, aspects that we're going to sort of prioritise for face to face. Uh, so the actual uh, preschool entry meeting, uh, we would still offer virtually um, with us using uh, teams to join the meeting, but we'd really recommend that parents were in the setting where possible and with you as practitioners, as part of that welcome into the setting. Um, but that meeting where the child is not usually there um, and we're talking about um, the child's um, areas of strength and interest and where they're going to need support um, we feel is not one that we need to physically necessarily be in the setting for but what we would want to do after the child had started with you is to come in um, six to eight weeks however however long we'll decide with you what uh, what what period would work best um, and we would like to come and make an observation of that child to see how those um, agreed outcomes are are, um, are developing and then we would then uh, hold a virtual review meeting and feed that information in that we'd we'd made um, our observations around and certainly with the very youngest children that will be the key piece of our offer key piece of work should I say that is um, our delivery offer for those children who um, are not starting school in that next academic year um, we would definitely want to do that robust piece of work with you around entry planning with an observation and a review but then probably we would have a much lighter touch um, uh, review of that uh, more on demand uh, or request should I say from yourselves um, until we're starting to move into transition planning when that child's moving into that year prior to school. Um, whenever we get um, new referrals and we uh, agree with you that we're going to take the child onto our caseload, we would prioritise that initial contact for a, for a visit um, so that we were able to come in and see the child within the setting um, and see how they typically play and talk with you yourselves around um, how that, um, you know, how, which strategies you've used and what's working well etc um, and part of that would be to offer to meet those parents face to face they will always be offered that opportunity and if they'd like to take that up then from a practical perspective we try and roll that into the initial visit that we make to the setting uh, some parents may say they would prefer or just be as happy uh, to meet with us virtually either like this on teams or um, on the phone in which case we may schedule that to happen um, after the um, after the observation that we've made in the setting. Um, and the other thing that we would prioritise for face to face working is around reviews where there's been perhaps a significant change in the child's needs um, or there's a real escalation of concern. Um, and therefore, we'd be talking to you um, uh, over the phone around whether um, a visit would be appropriate for that particular child. So those are not exclusively the only things that we would offer face to face, but those are the ones that we will absolutely prioritise for um, face to face visits. Um, so with virtual working then, um, we will usually, um, you'll see that I'm, I'm using the language carefully here because I, I don't want anybody to leave this session feeling that there is um, a complete inflexibility and that we're going to be incredibly rigid about all this. But hopefully having given you the context at the beginning, you'll see why we are making these choices um, and why we want to try this um, to see whether it's something we can take forward more as a, a business as usual um, approach rather than something that is um, uh, just a kind of response to the pandemic, so to speak. Um, so we will usually work virtually in, in these situations. So as I've just mentioned, the actual preschool entry plan and review meetings would be virtual with the face-to-face um, -face observation uh, forming part of that kind of package, if you like, in between. Um, school entry plan and review meetings, uh, we've certainly had feedback from schools that uh, they are quite comfortable with that format, even if the parent has joined them um, at the school which we'd always recommend as part of that welcome into the school um, 
we are able to join virtually in what we would call, call a kind of blended meeting with some people there face to face and some joining virtually. Um, and we're able to offer all of the same support in terms of chairing that meeting uh, that we've always been able to do, um, but there, um, but this time doing it through Teams. Um, as we've mentioned, reviews of children, um, we will move more towards doing virtually. Um, and um, I'll talk a little bit more about how that will look um, in the next couple of slides. Uh, PEP meetings, the personal education plan meetings that we have for children looked after, we are already working um, virtually on the majority of those, um, almost all of them, I believe, uh, with uh, colleagues from the social work, social work service. Um, and as you'll be well aware, if you've done a PEP meeting recently, there is an ePEP, an electronic version of the PEP now, and that really obviously lends itself to this kind of virtual approach. The other meetings you might come across, um, outcomes meetings, and I've realised I've all I've missed family service plan meetings off there, which I shouldn't have done. Um, and those those two are examples of meetings that we would hold in that kind of team around the child approach uh, for those children with higher level of needs. Outcomes relates to the um, EHCP process, and family service plan um, meetings sit within the Maisie process for those families that need that additional um, higher level of individual support. Um, but we've been working virtually um, in, in all cases um, over the pandemic period and what we have noticed is that we often have more professionals on the call because it's easier for them to join virtually um, so where we may not have um, a, a paediatrician or a language therapist or somebody who would be able to travel to a meeting and join they're able to dip in even if it's for a short part of the meeting um, and that's been really beneficial. Just as an aside, um, our Maisie meetings that you're well, where we hold um, in every area, every half term, um, we've had a greater attendance at those meetings virtually um, and paediatricians and other colleagues who are health service based have been able to join us in a way that they couldn't when they were um, having to travel to the meetings. Um, and that's been a huge advantage to our discussions. Uh, and the other area really is our training sessions. Um, we are not saying uh, that we will never deliver face to face training, but where we have successfully um, sort of mapped across uh, our face to face training to virtual packages, um, for example, our initial, uh, what was our two day initial Senko training, uh, we've delivered four times now as um, uh, as four um, afternoon or morning half day sessions virtually um, and the feedback um, uh, from almost all uh, uh, attendees has been very positive. Um, obviously, we've had a few technical glitches, particularly in the first instance when we were learning some techniques around grouping people, etc. Um, but we feel we've really um, we've really overcome a lot of those. And um, the feedback has been um, very positive around uh, splitting those two days over the four sessions, making Making it a bit more accessible for people um, and, and out of interest um, when I looked recently to see what bookings we'd had on our next training which is coming up um, during this term um, traditionally we used to sort of do uh, the training face to face in geographical areas throughout the year um, so the autumn term would be in the Sedgemoor area and nine times out of ten people from that area would attend there and then we'd go Taunton and Mendip and and um, uh, Taun and um, West and uh, South Somerset, sorry. Um, obviously, some people were prepared to travel quite a long way to get there, but majority seemed to wait for their um, geographical area to kind of come around. So if people in Sedgemoor missed the, um, the the autumn training, they very often would go for quite some time without having their training. Uh, what was interesting when I looked at who'd signed up for the uh, upcoming one is people were from all over the county. We literally have people from uh, Froome and Minehead and uh, down South Somerset and up in North Sedgemoor and um, you know the um, geography is no barrier anymore and I think that's um, you know that's a, a, a real plus and we get that nice uh, mixture of people then coming from different different areas. One thing we would say around the team's uh, training is we would really recommend if you haven't already uh, downloading the Microsoft Teams app um, it's possible to, um, as you know, access uh, Teams, um, I think, just in a kind of online version. Um, but having the app gives you the full functionality and really helps you to kind of be able to participate more um, in uh, some of the training activities, for example. 
So just wanted to return quickly to uh, mentioned uh, review visits and uh, how we are going to be um, uh, as a default position, if you like, um, offering those um, through a virtual format. And some of you will be familiar with this um, grid that we attach at the bottom of our initial uh, visit, note of visit, um, and very often we will pop over on the left hand side there um, just the agreed outcomes that we've discussed and put into the body of our note of visit. Um, what we ask settings to do is to have a, a look before the um, review view is due uh, at how the child's progressing towards those outcomes and to note whether they think that's fully met or partially met or um, or not yet met um, and so we can kind of get a measure of um, of how that progress um, is is moving forward um, and I think in some areas and this is where we need to take some responsibility within our service about consistency uh, uh, I know that in some areas um, area senkos have been consistently requesting that settings return these forms um, uh, as a matter of course um, uh, before any review happens and it's been incredibly useful where that's happened because it's given us a really up-to-date snapshot um, of your views around how that child's progressing and it really helps us to kind of plot the next steps and see which um, which would be the most appropriate um, outcomes to agree um, going forward in the next kind of period. Uh, but what we are going to, um, to, to aim to do is to really embed this process right across the county so that we are all using this approach. And so um, prior to um, a, a review of a child, we will give you a little prompt, probably an email, uh, just to say, um, please, can you make sure that you've um, completed that uh, review format, which should only really take literally five or 10 minutes, um, as you'll know, the child child well and you'll know uh, from working with the child and and I'm, I'm saying you I would suggest the key person does it so if you've got Senkos and managers on the line it could be that you'll be working with the key person um, and supporting them to do this um, but it's just capturing a few um comments around the child's progress in those areas and having a think about whether you would regard that as being fully met and this is where when we then have our review phone call or our teams meeting with you whichever we decide would work best um, we will then have a more in-depth discussion with you about um, what it was that made you feel that they'd fully met that and was it something that they could do independently and consistently um, is that something we want to carry forward onto our next um, sort of ag agreed outcomes if you like so um, uh, that's something that is out there now. Some settings are really familiar with it and using it, but I am aware it's not necessarily a county-wide thing. And that's what we would really like to kind of embed in this next period, really. And we'll offer whatever support people would like if it's not a familiar, um, if it's not a familiar format to you. So just um, just summarising a little bit around the um, advantages then about um, virtual working, we have already touched on these on a previous slide, really. But I think where we have um, chosen to continue with virtual working going forward, um, what we've um, noted, as we mentioned earlier, is around that reduced travel time, not just for our service, to be really clear. Um, I mean, thinking about, um, you know, yourselves and the um, demands on your time to come out of a setting and to join um, training or to join a meeting, uh, not having to travel is is an advantage to all of us. Um, and I think, as mentioned previously, more settings we're finding are uh, sorry, more services are able to join meetings, and that will just give us that kind of wider scope in our in our discussions. Um, some of the other things on there um, we've all already covered, um, as I mentioned on previous slides. But um, one thing I just wanted to pull out is that. Um, the use of teams does also support the option of making observations of children. Um, and um, obviously, as soon as um, a kind of camera is involved in a setting, observing a child, then naturally all of our little alarm bells start ringing and we wonder about whether that's OK and whether that's something that we should be doing. And so consequently, we have checked this out with the kind of legal side of things to find out whether we are OK to do that. Um, and what, what has come back from the um, local authority teams uh, is that provided we are not recording 
um, what we are observing. Um, and we are literally just using Teams as a lens to look through in the same way uh, that we would if we were stood in your setting, looking around at um, the child concerned, but all of the child's peers as well. Um, there really is no um, discernible difference between making um, an observation through Teams and making an observation when we're stood in your setting. So that is another option, for example, as part of a review, um, we could keep it virtual, uh, but you may say, look, I really would like you to just have a look at snack time. You know, if we can make the review over snack time, for example, um, then um, we will be able to use Teams for you to observe something, you know, just for um, perhaps 10 minutes or so. Um, and, and that would be a, a very, very good use of time but without ne necessitating uh, what could be, you know, an hour's travelling if you include both ways um, and the rest for some people, uh, depending on where they actually live. Um, and I think the final point, I mean, I hope the final point will be uh, less and less relevant as we move forward, but it does definitely continue to be a safer option for all of us while there is still um, pretty high in, in infection rates. I mean, we, we get um, sight of all the uh, different cases across the, the county and, um, you know, it is, it is clear that there are, you know, still significant number of, of cases out there um, and clearly um, having visitors in and out of your setting um, is is another potential way um, of of kind of inflaming that situation. So you know, at the moment, um, although what I'm suggesting um, uh, is 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 long term, not just for this pandemic. Um, I think we have to acknowledge that that's a key a key point um, at this at this point in time. Um, so let's let's just share with you a couple of the um, uh, of the kind of comments from the the, the feedback we got um, when I mentioned earlier we sent out some Microsoft C, uh, Microsoft forms surveys um, and this was some of the the feedback um, we received uh, on this slide from from parents so I'm just going to give you um, a minute or two just to read through those comments that were um, directly lifted from the forms. Oh, that's jumped a bit. Sorry. Can you all see the feedback from parents? Not yet, Jane. You might need to share your screen again. OK, I think um, it's possible that um, somebody may have accidentally clicked on something there, so bear with me. I'm hopeful that you can see that form, um, that feedback now. Is that is that what everybody's yeah, able to see? It. Yeah, we've got yeah. it. Yeah, all good. Brilliant. Apologies. So I think just just pulling out um, a, a couple of a, a couple of, of, of key points there. Um, I think um, obviously the travel one has been mentioned, but I think um, the comment there at the bottom about it, it it worked well, especially as I'd met everyone in the meeting before. And I think that just reminds us, as we said at the beginning, um, around the importance of um, having those face to face opportunities to build a relationship. It's not um, a big deal then, is it, so much to 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 talk to somebody virtually if you've actually physically met them. Um, and had that opportunity to to build a, a bit of a rapport uh, before moving to a, a kind of virtual format. Um, and then on the um, on the next slide, uh, these were some of the things that we pulled uh, off the um, forms around um, the feedback given to us by practitioners. So I'm just going to give you a couple of minutes to have a look at that. I mean, when we come um, to, to finish the presentation or, or indeed now, if you prefer, um, I'd be really interested to know from people on the line whether you feel that these comments, you know, reflect your own experiences or, or um, you know, whether whether you feel differently, um, because I'm, I'm certainly not suggesting that, um, you know, everybody universally was in complete agreement, um, uh, uh, you know, about moving wholesale to a virtual way of working, which is incidentally not what we're suggesting. Um, but 
I'm just uh, keen to share with you um, some of the things I, I hadn't really um, considered. I mean, the, the top one there about the, the size of the setting, that's an obvious one, isn't it? That, you know, virtual meetings enable uh, people to actually have more people at the meeting because, um, you know, we've we've all had those meetings where we're sort of leaning up against the, the kitchen cupboard or we're in the, um, you know, the corridor somewhere and trying to uh, have a confidential meeting when other people are coming back and forth. And um, I think, you know, being able to sort of perhaps shut yourself in a small space with a computer and really focus in on talking to a group of people um, can help to uh, to include a lot of people in a meeting where you don't have the physical space, you know. Um, what we want to also um, highlight to you is that we um, have developed a document as, as a service which really gives a lot more detail um, to each of the different aspects of our work um, and shares with you what we will be offering um, as, as our service delivery. Um, and I have um, just sort of completed it and sent it to be um, uploaded onto the um, Support Services for Education page that the area SENCOs have. It possibly won't be there yet, um, because even though the person I sent it to is amazingly efficient, um, I doubt if she's had time to do it. Um, so bear with us just for um, a day or so, but you will find a document on there very soon, which is just called the um, area, um, the earliest area Senko uh, um, service offer, um, which basically uh, includes a grid uh, with all the different aspects of our work, like our initial contacts, reviews, the um, uh, outcomes meetings, all the things that we've uh, referenced at various points in this presentation. Um, and next to each of those um, breaks down in some more detail uh, what you can expect, you know, where we will um, definitely prioritise a face to face visit um, and where we would be looking to try and make things work virtually. Um, but, you know, what we want to uh, really emphasise to you is, although that will be our default way of working, where we would expect to work in the vast majority of cases, we absolutely want to, um, uh, you know, be responsive to any concerns or um, any uh, any sort of priorities you have in terms of needing some face to face support. So uh, we, we, you know, we will always discuss that with you and, and, and always be open to, um, you know, coming to, 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 to an arrangement that works for for both of us, because I think the overarching um, the overarching aim for us really is to really um, strengthen our, our partnership working with um, early years settings. Um, I feel, um, you know, really strongly that um, that is something that we have um, managed to develop as a strength between us all, that we have a nice partnership approach. And even during the, um, the, the darkest lockdown periods where people, you know, couldn't venture out the door, it seemed, um, we we were still having regular email contacts with people and, and phone calls before we kind of sussed out the whole Teams thing and got going on that. So um, I'd like to think that if our partnership working with you kind of survived all those um, rough periods of, of those um, complete lockdowns that, you know, we should be able to really work on uh, the good bits, um, you know, of, of what we've learnt uh, from that pandemic period. So have a look out for that document to say not necessarily today. Um, what we can also do uh, when it's up there is just perhaps send a link around to you so that you're um, aware uh, that it's up there. Then you can have a look at it in a little bit more detail. Obviously, if you've got any queries or questions when you've looked at the document, um, please, uh, please get back to us. Um, so what we would like to do over time um, is obviously evaluate how this is working, because um, we think um, that uh, we will be able to work more effectively and we'll be able to work in a more targeted way um, and really make sure that we focus our support where it's most needed. Um, but obviously, um, we don't know uh, for sure how that's going to play out until we've um, really put all these ideas into practice over a period of time. Um, so although we're really happy to take comments and feedback today, that would be that would be great. Um, we also would like to revisit this, um, you know, after a period of time to um, talk to you. It might be uh, doing another session like this, or it could be that we we pop out a survey to you to see how it, it feels um, after we've been working like this for a period of time. Um, but I, I guess um, 
what we did reach really was the conclusion that um, we needed to recognise the parameters of what's actually possible to deliver as a, as a service. Um, and I think um, going back to a wholesale face-to-face -face delivery, given the um, increase um, of referrals and the complexity of children's needs is not really an option for us. But I guess um, what we have reflected on is it's not even an option that we think would be desirable because we think we could make better use of our time um, by working um, in this in this way. Um, so I think today, just to summarise, you know, today in itself um, is something that I think um, really encapsulates the argument that we're kind of putting forward because I remember um, a few years ago now and lots of you I'm sure will remember uh, when there was um, a change to the uh, high needs funding um, approach and we introduced that my early years send review um, and um, a, a, a kind of different way of making an application and it was around this time of year I think in September and I just remember talking to people in the team um, that what we did at the time to get the information to you as I'm giving the information about about this change to you today um, is I think we booked probably about seven or eight different venues around the county and then in twos and threes uh, we traveled sometimes you know miles across the county to meet uh, with smaller groups of you um, than we've certainly got on the call today um, uh, and you had all traveled for miles and miles to get there in some cases um, and it was not necessarily a very long session but I remember the traveling either side was longer than the session um, and I don't think we had as many people as we've probably got uh, in total on, on, on the call with us today. So uh, I think, you know, it, it does sort of show that um, in, in some instances it can be a really kind of effective um, and, and efficient use of everybody's time, really. Um, so that's just a, a thought to kind of um, round the session up with. But um, we have got another sort of 10 minutes or so, uh, which we um, I, I will be around for as we'll will colleagues from the uh, the team. But if anybody has got any sort of comments or questions, I can see a couple of things coming through in the chat. I don't know if anybody in the team um, is able to kind of just feed back some of the things that have come through in the chat. I can't. We've had some, oh, go on, Kiri. I was going to say we've had some really positive um, comments about virtual working. Um, Sophie said, yes, works well virtually. And Lucy, um, I agree, virtually works well. And um, Nat has said there's a place for both virtual and face to face. And I think the model sounds good and well thought out. So that's lovely. Thank you, Nat. And a lovely comment from Oakland saying a fantastic service. We couldn't help these children in our setting without you all. Virtually, thank you, or face to face. Oh, that's, um, that's great. Thank you. Yeah. There was one question from Kim. Um, she would be interested to, to know more about the survey that was sent out to parents. Um, were all parents with SEND children contacted? That would be no. really helpful. Michaela's replied that um, we didn't ask for consent to share that survey with outside agencies, so it, it wouldn't be able to be shared out of our team. Um, but I think I can I can give it some context, uh, however, that um, we literally took a sample survey um, around um, a set sort of period of time just for um, uh, we, we made sure we had a range of um, of, of sort of um, service delivery things that we took um, feedback on, such as training or different types of meetings. Um, but we just sampled it um you know so that we could get a, a range if you like so it was never designed to be um a kind of comprehensive survey to everybody but i think going forward uh when we want to really um evaluate how this um, is working sort of as a, as a longer term model um i think actually a, a much broader survey to 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 all um you know parents and practitioners would be a really good way forward I have to say, Jane, I think the survey stands up. It, it, we, we asked enough people, so it would qualify as, as a, 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 a significant survey and a big enough sample. But mm -hmm. there were there would be ethical concerns around sharing it because Kim wanted it shared, but we didn't get ethical consent from participants to share it. It was only for our survey, so our yeah. service. So we have to keep that in house. Mm. Yeah, no, thank you. And I, I think I think really um, my uh, my real interest is is taking that snapshot again 
in the future, if you like, to see, um, you know, sort of how, how this is um, embedding and how it's working for people. Jane, there are a couple of questions around the level three and training. So the first one is, how often do SENCOs need to review the two day training with us if they have the level three qualification already? And then just some general information regarding how to get the, the level three qualification. I mean, what might be useful um, is we could we could probably send something out around the the level three just so that everybody's got that. But there, there, we haven't a, a, a date planned as yet for the next round because we have a group a cohort kind of finishing up over the summer. Um, if possible, we will try and do one. I would imagine in the springtime. Um, and, and what we were saying is that um, anybody who had completed the training, um, I think it was from September. Um, 2019, I think I'd have to check, it might have been 18, uh, was when we mapped across the um, uh, specification from the national award to the first two days of our training. Because the way it works is that you would do the um, initial role of the early years SENCO training, which is a standalone piece of training that we'd recommend for all SENCOs. And um, as far as repeating that, um, I would say as a rule of thumb, you'd, you would probably benefit from repeating it every two to three years purely because um, we tweak it every year to make sure that we're reflecting any new legislation or any um, changes that have happened um, that we feel that you should be aware of, um, either locally or nationally. Um, so, uh, you know, in order to keep abreast of things, that 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 would be recommended. And, and uh, as far as people who've got the level three, I, I guess what, what I would say more than anything is we'd really recommend um, signing up to the workshop package because that's um, our kind of follow on CPD, if you like. That's the the thing that we recommend um, SENCOs um, would uh, engage with for that ongoing um, professional development because we take uh, some of the topics that we've covered in the initial training and actually look at them in a bit more depth in each workshop alongside doing some kind of local and national updates. So as far as uh, ongoing CPD, particularly for those people who've got the level three, um, I would think that would be um, probably the best focus. Thank you, Natalie. I did see that comment come up. That's super. Thank you. Um, that uh, just in case I've encouraged people there to to to, to scurry off and, and look to sign off for workshops. Um, I'm actually meeting with the um, person who uploads the uh, workshop information with me on the um, SSE website uh, the begin very beginning of next week. So it should be up there for this term um, uh, with a similar kind of package. And we've tried to keep the price exactly as it's been for the last few years, which we think represents pretty good value. Value, uh, but that information um, for the workshops won't be there just yet. Um, it will be um, it, it, it will be uh, uploaded next week. Um, okay. Were there any somebody's other? Asked, uh, somebody's asked for a bit more information about the level three training, Jane. And I was just going to type in that that's delivered with um, jointly with Skill. Um, yeah. And um, I think at the uh, the next. Um, the next level three training isn't yet available to book. Do you do we have a date for that, Jane? I not as yet, because I think um, there is limited capacity within the staff at Skill to, they obviously do all the um, marking and it's accredited by cash. Um, and um, I think what they like to do is kind of completely wrap up one cohort before kind of moving on to another one. So um, we have been aiming to do one uh, uh, every academic year. And I think one year we managed to do two, um, but it builds onto that two day training. So if you are interested in level three, but you haven't done the two day initial training, um, it's worth looking to get onto that one first. But equally, if, if you want to see how it would work for you individually, then do ask your own, you know, your your area Senko and we would talk to you about, um, you know, different pathways and options that you'd have. So, um, you know, please, please, because um, different people might be in slightly different positions. Jane, there's also a question about EHC review meetings and nurseries taking the lead. Do you want to talk about that now or wait for another time? Um, what, what was it specifically? It's about the role that nurseries have taking the lead in those meetings. Mm -hmm an annual review yeah um, I mean what we will um, I, 
be offering some early years training around annual reviews um, with, with a date yet to be decided. There's school training going out at the moment for school SENCOs because um, uh, SENCOs in schools and settings have said, you know, it's something that they feel they would like more support with. Um, so when I saw there was some training going for school SENCOs, I said, what about early years? And so I, I um, have been emailing the person who designed the training to um, make sure that we get in on that until we have really done um, some some robust training for the early years sector, our team will always be involved to support and facilitate and work alongside you um, with uh, the annual review meetings that you will be uh, undertaking. But the hope is in time that people will feel with experience that they are skilled to follow um, the pattern that the school centres are doing, whereby they would um, be sort of leading the meeting uh, and, and, and sort of writing it up onto the portal. But we will talk to individual settings about where they are in their own journey journey towards um towards doing that and we absolutely want to sort of work alongside um but so uh, no don't worry you did one last week that's fine that's absolutely fine there's nothing in fact brilliant you know if you have if you have completed one that's fabulous i suppose i was taking the question more from the perspective of somebody being anxious about not having the support um so you know i was just trying to reassure people that you know we would we would be involved so um i think it depends on how frequently you've done them within your setting how confident and familiar you feel with the paperwork um clearly there'll be some settings that really regularly are involved with children with the hcps and then there'll be others for whom it's really quite unusual so you may you know you want perhaps a bit more support. Um, and I hope that fits in with the message we've been trying to give you today, that we are flexible in our support and we will look at individual cases um, as far as we possibly can. Thank you. OK, um, I mean, we're virtually at the hour. I didn't think um, I would talk that long, but then people who know me think, of course you could. <laughs> so um, I, I hope that you do feel you've had enough opportunity to comment and ask questions. I'm very happy to stay, um, you know, on the line for a bit longer or take any emails, um, uh, any comments from you. And, and uh, although we will have a more official way of feeding back with an evaluation, um, as we go along, as we get going with this, um, you know, please, um, please do feedback to our team, um, you know, positive comments or things that are not going so well, um, and we'll do our best to address them. Thank you. OK, so we've officially finished. I'm going to pop the recording off, but I'm going to stay on the on the. I think I'm going to pop the recording off.